we'll get started. My name is Damon Huss. You see my name there. I'm your presenter today from Constitutional Rights Foundation. This is the webinar, Using Supreme Court Cases to Teach Common Core Standards. Our objectives here today, generally speaking, are that you will be able to gain a background in the upcoming Supreme Court year and specifically on the law as it pertains to affirmative action. You'll also use common core aligned approaches to teaching about Supreme Court decisions. And you'll be able to implement a lesson that we'll show you after Dean Chemerinsky speaks to help you and your students understand the process of Supreme Court decision making and also the important Fisher decision that's going to be coming up in the new Supreme Court term. I also just want to point out that we're going to talk about affirmative action as a topic that could be potentially controversial in the classroom. And that's part of civic education is being able to work with controversial topics in a constructive way. One bit of housekeeping at the end of this webinar, we're going to give you a link to a survey. If you're a K through 12 teacher, as you saw in the uh, reminder emails that I sent you, there's going to be a survey and it makes you eligible for a $50 stipend if you're one of the first 10 teachers who register and attend this webinar. But also, all teachers who are on this webinar and take the survey will be entered into a drawing for one of two $500 cash prizes or one of ten $100 prizes. So isn't that something extra that you perhaps were not expecting? But we're very grateful to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for making those prizes possible, but also for making this webinar possible, as well as all of the resources that we've been developing to teach Common Core State Standards in the Social Studies. Uh, to help us keep these resources coming, we do ask you to take this survey. It also has a benefit for you, as you can see on your screen. I will repeat this slide later, and I'll give you the link at the end of the webinar. And now we're going to move forward right in with our special guest, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. I'm going to give a brief introduction here, uh, but some of the information about his uh, career will appear on your screen as he's talking. Uh, CRF has a long-standing connection with Dean Chemerinsky. Uh, he wrote the first chapter to our book, Landmarks, Historic U.S. Supreme Court Decisions, and his chapter is called Inside the Marble Temple, and it's a great lesson for teaching students about the workings of the Supreme Court. It's for grades 9 through 12, and it's, uh, it's really a good resource. Uh, he's been dean of the... University of California at Irvine School of Law since 2008. Uh, formerly, he was a professor at Duke University and USC Law Schools. Uh, and I just have to say that uh, I have had the pleasure of seeing him speak on numerous occasions, including just a few years ago at CRF's own spring dinner, uh, one of our, our big fundraisers during the year. He also taught my bar review course on constitutional law uh, here in California, which was one of the best educations I've had in constitutional law myself. He's really down to earth and makes the law understandable for lawyers and non-lawyers alike. So it's really a privilege that we have him here on our webinar. And with that, I'm going to turn over the uh, microphone virtually to Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. And Erwin, I welcome you to our webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the privilege of talking with everybody. The instructions that I was given talk a bit about last term of the Supreme Court and then talk a bit about next term, especially Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, the affirmative action case. And I think that the two cases that I want to talk about both raise the same question that really is at the center of discussions of constitutional law. Who should be making which decisions in society? What are the decisions that are appropriate for the judiciary? And what are the decisions that are appropriate for the political process? There's no agreement about it, and I think it's worth contrasting two cases, the most important from last term, most likely the most important in the coming term, which will start next Monday, first Monday of October, October 5th. The case I want to talk about from last term is familiar with all of you. It came down on Friday, June 26th of this year. It's Obergefell versus Hodges. It involves state laws in Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee that prohibited same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, 
declared these laws unconstitutional. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote for the court. His opinion was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia, Thomas, and Alito each wrote separate dissenting opinions. It's worth noting that Justice Kennedy's majority opinion gave two separate reasons why laws that prohibit same-sex marriage are unconstitutional. First, he says, they violate the right to marry. The Supreme Court has long said that the right to marry is a fundamental right under the Constitution, even though nowhere is it mentioned in the text. The most famous case was in, aptly titled Loving versus Virginia in 1967 that involved a Virginia law that prohibited interracial marriage. The Supreme Court not only said that it was a form of race discrimination, but the court also declared that the right to marry is protected as a fundamental right under the word liberty in the Due Process Clause. Other cases, too, have recognized the right to marry as a fundamental right. In fact, the Supreme Court has found many rights to be protected as fundamental, even though they're not mentioned in the text of the Constitution. So, for example, the right to procreate, the right of parents to custody their children, the right to keep the family together, the right of parents to control the upbringing of their children, the right to purchase and use contraceptives, the right to abortion, the right to engage, <coughs> excuse me, the right to engage in private, consensual, adult homosexual activity, the right to refuse medical treatment are all fundamental rights, even though they're not protected in the text of the Constitution. Justice Kennedy said that same-sex couples are identically situated to opposite-sex couples with regard to all of the reasons why marriage is protected as a fundamental right. He said we protect marriage as a fundamental right because of importance to individuals in their lives, because of its significance for children, because of its role in society. He said there's no difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples with regard to why marriage is a fundamental right. He then went on and said that laws that prohibit same-sex marriage deny equal protection to gays and lesbians. Two years earlier, in United States versus Windsor, the court declared unconstitutional Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, a provision of federal law that says that marriage for purpose of federal law and federal benefits had to be between a man and a woman. And the Supreme Court there, five to four, same split among the justices, said that that denied equal protection to gays and lesbians. As I mentioned, each of the four dissenting justices wrote a separate opinion. And their opinions echoed the same themes. Their opinions all said, this is a matter that should be left to the political process. This should be something that should be left to the states to decide. Each accused the majority of undue judicial activism. Now, I think a key question that all of the justices have to answer, and that indeed your students have to face, is there any legitimate, let alone compelling reason, to keep same-sex couples from being able to marry? Any discrimination in society can be challenged as denying equal protection. Any discrimination must be supported by at least a legitimate government purpose. The question that I think the court inescapably had to answer is any legitimate government interest served by keeping same-sex couples from being able to marry. The majority said no. The dissent said, leave it to the states. And if they want to have the traditional definition of marriage, they should be able to. Well, let me compare that case to the one that's already been alluded to that's on the docket for the coming term, Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. In 1993, in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court ruled five to four that colleges, universities, have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. And the court said that colleges and universities may use race as one fact among many in their admissions decisions to benefit minorities and to enhance diversity. This echoed what Justice Lewis Powell had said in his opinion in University of California Regents versus Bakke back in 1978. 
What's notable about Grutter versus Bollinger is that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the majority, joined by Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the dissent, and he was joined by Justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. I stress this, and I think it's important to stress it for your students, because the composition of the court has changed greatly since 2003. Most of those changes don't matter in terms of what's likely to happen in Fisher. So, for example, Chief Justice Roberts replaced Chief Justice Rehnquist, but they have the same views on affirmative action. Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion in 2007 saying that he thinks the Constitution requires that the government be colorblind, and he believes that diversity is not a compelling interest. That's Chief Justice Rehnquist's position. Justice Sotomayor replacing Justice Souter, Justice Kagan replacing Justice Stevens, doesn't change anything. Justice Sotomayor has the same views on affirmative action, it seems, as Justice Souter, the Justice she replaced, Justice Kagan the same views as Justice Stevens, the Justice she replaced. But the key difference is Samuel Alito replacing Sandra Day O'Connor, whereas Sandra Day O'Connor voted to uphold affirmative action, Samuel Alito is a strong foe of affirmative action. He joined John Roberts' opinion back in 2007, saying the Constitution requires colorblindness and that diversity is not a compelling interest. All of this sets the stage for the case we've now alluded to several times, Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. Abigail Fisher applied for the University of Texas in 2008. She was rejected. She went to Louisiana State University, from which she graduated in 2012. In 2004, the regents of the University of Texas saw that their school was less diverse than it had been, even as recently as 1996. There were fewer African Americans at the school in 2004 than there had been in 1996. So the regents of the University of Texas adopted a new admissions policy. About 75% of each entering class would be obtained by taking the top 10% from high schools across the state. Texas is sufficiently racially segregated that that would lead to some diversity. But it still wouldn't get back to the 2000 1996 levels. So the region said, for the other 25%, an individualized review will be done of each file. For every applicant, an admission score was calculated. The score is the sum of two numbers. One is called the Academic Achievement Index, the student's grades and test scores. The other is a personal achievement index. That number was arrived at by grading two essays required in the application and looking at six factors. Diversity was one of the six factors. Abigail Fisher challenged the use of race at all in admissions. The federal district court in Texas upheld the University of Texas plan based on Grutter versus Bollinger. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit affirmed, but the Supreme Court in 2013 reversed. It was actually a seven to one decision. Justice Kagan was recused because she had participated in the case when she was Solicitor General of the United States. And Justice Kennedy writing for the court said, it's not enough that there be a compelling interest in diversity. A college or university must show that there's no other way to achieve diversity except the use of race. The college or university must show there's no race neutral way to gain diversity. The court sent the case back to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit, in the summer of 2014, in a two-to-one decision, said, Texas has adequately shown that there's no other way to achieve diversity, and the court again upheld the plan. The Supreme Court granted review. Maybe this case will just be about what does a college or university have to show in order to demonstrate there's no other way to achieve diversity? Or maybe now, is some think there might be five votes on the current court to overrule Grutter and eliminate all affirmative action. Justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas dissented in Grutter, and Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito are strong opponents of Grutter. Well, how do these two cases relate to one another? You'll notice in the first case I talked about, Oberfeld versus Hodges, it was the foremost liberal justices, joined by Justice Kennedy, who strike down the laws that had been adopted in Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. 
There was the conservative justices who were claiming the need for judicial deference and judicial restraint. With regard to affirmative action, it's the conservative justices who want to strike down the laws that are adopted and the policies adopted in states. And it's the liberal justices who are urging judicial restraint and deference to government. To me, that's such an important lesson for all of us, including your students. There are times when conservatives want to defer to the political process, and there are times when conservatives want to overrule the political process. There's times when liberals want to defer to the political process, and there's times when liberals want to overrule the political process. It's just a question of when. And of course, that then, as I said at the very beginning, goes to the central question in constitutional law of who should be making which decisions. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you very much. That was uh, corroborating my statement that you taught constitutional law very clearly when I took it before. And I'm wondering if there's time for answering any questions that anyone might have, maybe one or two questions. If any of our participants... I have time. Great. If any of our participants have questions, you can write them in the chat area over there the left. And one question is, how can I incorporate this material uh, sort of at the elementary or fifth grade level? What might be a way to, I mean, this is something that um, we can talk about in, in this webinar. I do want to address that. Um, I'm wondering if there's another question that might be Let me just I'll say, well, these that. cases may not yeah. be the best vehicle at the elementary level. I think that the question of why do we have a constitution and how is the constitution different from other laws is one that can be addressed at the elementary school level. And I've often gone into fifth grade classes, even more frequently into eighth grade classes. I've done the tour of the junior high schools in my area talking to the eighth graders studying the constitution. And I always try to get them to think about, well, if we're a democracy, why don't we want to leave everything to the vote of the people? Isn't that what democracy is supposed to be? And I think that even students in the fifth grade can understand, well, there are things we don't want to leave to just the majority, like people's rights. And once they see that, then they understand that what makes the Constitution different from all other laws is it's hard to change the Constitution. And they can think about, why should a nation that thinks itself as a democracy want to be governed by a document that no one alive voted for. In fact, most of us didn't have ancestors in the country. And I think that that's the kind of question that I've discovered that elementary school students relate well to, and it's easy to pick examples to talk about that with. And there's one question here, uh, Erwin, about uh, shouldn't the court use privileges and immunities to protect marriage? This is going back to the Obergefell case. Um, what would be the use of privileges and immunities in, in that case, or shouldn't the court use that? The court didn't mention the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. It's language that says that no state shall deny any citizen of the privileges or immunities of the United States citizenship. The court focused on the due process and the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. The reason for that is historical, as probably everybody in the call knows, in 1873, in what were called the slaughterhouse cases, the Supreme Court gave the Privileges and Immunities Clause a very narrow construction. The court's reading of it was so limiting as to essentially read it out of the Constitution. The Supreme Court said that courts should not use the Privileges and Immunities Clause to strike down state and local laws. Since 1873, there's only been one Supreme Court case that hasn't been overruled that's ever found anything to violate the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. That's why the Supreme Court didn't use it. It's really a clause that was buried by a single Supreme Court case and has hardly been revived since. Well, thank you so much again, Dean Chemerinsky, for Any being time. here with us. We're very grateful. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And with that as your background knowledge of the upcoming case, which I have up here on the screen, Fisher versus University of Texas, we'll move forward. But I do want to just 
note that this whole webinar will be posted on our website, and I will send a link out to everyone who is registered for the webinar, so that you can review it and you can listen again to Dean Chemerinsky's talk here about the affirmative action case on the 14th Amendment, and so it will be available. Uh, I'll also be sending a follow-up email to everyone on this webinar with uh, lesson materials that we're about to review. Shifting gears a little bit, but moving forward into talking about these issues in the classroom, we're going to move to the next poll question, and this has to do with how you handle controversial topics, topics that are potentially controversial in the classroom. What is the main method you use to discuss controversial topics in your classroom? Do you use A, debate, B, whole class discussion or deliberation? C, small group discussion or deliberation, D, simulation and role play activities, or E, I avoid discussion of controversies, it's too disruptive. Now, I, I asked what's the main method. You might use a combination of these methods, and that's great. But this is, what is the main method? Something that you, as a, an educator in a classroom, rely on the most. And I see so far, uh, a lot of our participants, most of our participants rely on a whole class discussion or deliberation for teaching controversial topics. And as we'll see, there's a way that we can integrate more than one of these uh, methods in the classroom. Uh, and especially the whole class and small class discussion and deliberation in combination with role play activities in dealing with controversial subjects. And that brings us to discussing controversial topics, and in this case, affirmative action. So this is a question, just to give you a little background, that was asked by Gallup back in 2013. And the question is, which comes closer to your view about evaluating students for admission into a college or university? And the two choices here are that applicants should be admitted solely on the basis of merit, even if that results in fewer minority students being admitted, or if I have AA, and of course I mean AB, applicants' racial and ethnic background should be considered to help promote diversity on college campuses, even if that means admitting some minority students who otherwise should not be admitted. So we have a difference in, in opinion here, and the way that Americans answered, or U.S. adults answered, was as follows. For the first answer, solely on the basis of merit, you see uh, just barely over two-thirds, 67%, of respondents are closer to the view that in evaluating students for university admissions it should be solely on the basis of merit and about 28 percent just over a quarter believe that racial and ethnic background should be considered considered as a factor um, in university admissions so you see this is almost the definition really of a controversial topic you have uh, a super majority of u.s adults polled uh, believing in be solely on the basis of merit option, but you do have a very significant minority of believing that racial and ethnic background should be considered as well. Now, for CRF, we have a quarterly publication, Bill of Rights in Action. Many of you may subscribe to it, and I'm going to plead with you uh, through this webinar to subscribe to it. It is free. And we have a lesson on teaching affirmative action using the very Fisher case that Dean Chemerinsky talked to us about. And you're probably wondering why I have Queen Elizabeth I up here. Well, that's the cover of Bill of Rights in Action. Uh, we have lessons on world history and U.S. history. But inside that particular issue, which is volume 29, uh, issue number two, we have this lesson, Affirmative Action in American Colleges After Fisher versus Texas. I will be sending uh, this lesson to you after this webinar. And it will also be available on our professional development website very soon as a link for you to be able to access it. But in this lesson, you would have a background in much of what uh, Dean Chemerinsky talked to us about earlier. Uh, you'll have a summary of the reforms that brought about affirmative action under Presidents Johnson and Nixon. But you'll also get the uh, challenges to affirmative action in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Bakke case, the Gratz and the Gruder case that uh, Dean Chemerinsky alluded to, as well, or spoke about, 
as well as the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Due Process Clause leading up to, of course, the Fisher case that we discussed. And in the lesson, there is a role play activity. And in this role play activity, students would play the role of trustees for a public university, and they would be given policy choices to discuss in small groups. So you would have a small group discussion and deliberation, and they would present their policy choices to the classroom. Now, this would follow a whole class uh, discussion or deliberation of questions that are included in the lesson just to give students a good, firm background in affirmative action and the 14th Amendment. The role play activity includes instructions for students, and I put in parentheses for the teacher because these actually help you in organizing the small groups in the classroom. And students are given information for their role play discussion groups as trustees to a public university. So in their discussion groups, they would be given options to consider, like considering the top 10% of high school graduates or race or ethnicity as a plus factor uh, or class-based affirmative action. Finally, just basing admissions on grades and test scores. So these are the options that they would have to discuss. Now, many of you use role play and simulation in your classrooms. And I just want to ask real quickly if you could answer in the chat room what are advantages of using role play in the classroom? So just take a moment here to share with us what you see as the advantages of using role play. And you can include simulation in there too. Simulation would be students actually reenacting a government process. Uh, role play where they actually take on the role uh, of someone within the government or within history in order to grapple with the information that they're given. Ah, I see here uh, Michelle Jordan writes, students might get out of their comfort zone and think from different perspectives. Hands on, says Ryan Menlo. Also, I see here engages students more fully. Ah, uses critical thinking. Very, very important in civic education as well as using these Supreme Court cases. A lot of what I see here is different perspectives and also students expressing themselves without fear of judgment. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Very important. Ah, a practical note, Kent CU writes, it can be graded. <laughs> That's very practical. Good, I see here listening to other life experiences. And I would uh, agree. I think one of the reasons we include a role play in this particular activity and why we include role plays and simulations in a lot of our materials is, of course, it's something fun for students to do. It's kind of a break with other routines of maybe uh, simply reading or answering questions. Uh, it's also interactive, and that allows students to actually speak with each other and communicate with each other, which is very important uh, for a number of reasons why they you know, look up from their phones and they're able to look at each other and communicate one-to-one -one or in a small group. Uh, of course, it also hits standards using role play, uh, and we'll see common core standards of speaking and listening, also reading informational text and reading in history and social studies. Very important to do that. And just to reiterate what many of you have said, it helps students uh, get out of their comfort zone, but also to deal with controversy, controversial subjects or potentially controversial subjects uh, constructively by being in a role. So students feel, uh, as one of you mentioned, protected. So they feel like they're able to maybe talk about an issue, and if they're in a role, they can kind of look at it uh, a little bit removed from maybe their initial emotional reaction to what uh, might be said in the classroom or what something they might have read that triggers an emotional response. Uh, emotions are important uh, for all of us, but in being able to use critical thinking in the classroom, it's important to be able to look at a controversial subject from multiple perspectives, as many of you uh, so accurately mentioned in the chat section. Multiple perspectives allow you to say, hey, other people might have a different uh, perspective, a different critique, even a different feeling, yes, about this particular subject, and I need to listen to that as well as express my own uh, feeling or critique of this particular subject. So a, a role play allows students that kind of removal in a sense of, from the, the immediate 
reaction to a controversy, as well as all the other uh, advantages and benefits that I mentioned and that we see in the chat section there. Now, in the lesson on affirmative action, there are uh, for discussion and writing questions that go pretty in depth into the reading and bring students back into the reading and the complex text that is included there. Uh, I've taken a couple of these writing questions and expanded on them just slightly so that you can actually use them when you do teach this lesson as writing activities that address Common Core State Standards as well as the content standards that uh, you need to address in your classroom. One of the questions is on the purpose of affirmative action, as you see in the lesson. So the question is, what is affirmative action? What is the purpose of affirmative action programs at public universities? Do you think this has a valuable purpose? Now for Common Core, just asking do you think of students is really not enough to get them back into the text. It's good to have an opinion, and hopefully students are doing critical thinking, but to ensure that they go back into the text and do that critical thinking, uh, I've added here that they need to explain their answers in at least one well-developed paragraph using evidence from the text of the article from Bill of Rights in Action. So the key in common core state standards in doing reading and then the follow-up doing the writing in response is to gather evidence from text. They need to be able to look at a text and, and develop reasoning that uses evidence. Another writing activity drawn from the questions I call You Be the Judge. Now this is another kind of role play which is uh, actually a, a great way for students to put themselves in the mind of a Supreme Court justice. And they can actually write a Supreme Court opinion. Now Supreme Court opinions tend to be very lengthy. Uh, but in this, the idea is just that they're able to express themselves and use critical thinking in order to show reasoning for the decision in the Fisher case. So here, imagine you're a Supreme Court justice. What did the Supreme Court decide in Fisher versus Texas? So they briefly state what it decided. And what would you have ruled if you were a justice on the court? So here I write, write one or two paragraphs using evidence from the article and Bill of Rights in Action to support your answer. And A, they can write a concurring opinion in which they agree with the majority decision. Or B, they can write a dissenting opinion in which they disagree with the majority decision. And I put one or two paragraphs here just to give you an option. You know your, your students. And if you think uh, they just need to write one paragraph just to, just to show that they have a basic understanding of the reasoning of the case, that might be enough. You can assign them to write two paragraphs. You can even assign them to write more than two paragraphs if you want to turn this into a, a more expansive writing assignment. That's perfectly fine. Now, I also will include, as you'll see in the lesson that you get, notes on concurring opinions and dissenting opinions. Because, of course, uh, in a concurring opinion, uh, a justice isn't just agreeing with the majority, but might be offering slightly different reasons why they agree with the majority. Now, your students uh, can simply emphasize some point of agreement that they have in order to write the concurrence, or they can write new reasons why they agree with the concurrence, uh, or agree with, them, sorry, the majority opinion. You can encourage them to go back into the text and think about what they would add to the majority's decision, something that they might feel is important. And it could be something that is based on their own reading and experience, um, but they can add to what's in the text, and that's important for a concurrence. Now, in a dissenting opinion, of course, they can't just say, I disagree, but they need to say why they disagree. And so there will be uh, notes in the lesson that you get in order to explain how they can do that. A third writing activity is, are there alternatives? And this can be expanded based upon the Common Core standard on writing uh, an argument that focuses on discipline-specific content. So here, students will look at what alternatives to affirmative action do schools have to achieve greater diversity on their campuses. Once they've done the role play activity and they've read the actual lesson, they'll be familiar with some of these alternatives to affirmative action. So they can draw from those. Uh, and I have here also they can do additional research to see what other colleges or universities besides the University of Texas use to achieve greater diversity on campus. Uh, I have here that in three paragraphs, you can make it five if you want, 
Uh, three paragraphs explain the pros and cons of these alternatives. In the third paragraph, write a conclusion explaining whether you think these alternatives are more or less effective than affirmative action in achieving diversity, and explain your conclusion with evidence from your reading and research. So here students are understanding that diversity has been you know, recognized as something very important for college admissions, but they're looking at what might be more or less effective means. They might think affirmative action is the most effective means, and that's fine. They can write that in their uh, argumentative writing as long as they back it up with evidence from text, of course. So now we're going to take a closer look at the actual Common Core standards that are addressed in the role play activity, reading the lesson, and these writing activities. First of all, uh, I think most of us here are, uh, who are educators are social studies educators. I think we have some English language arts teachers on here as well. And it's in the English language arts Common Core State Standards that we actually see U.S. Supreme Court decisions specifically mentioned. So here, students will be reading the article as informational text, and they're going to evaluate the reasoning of seminal U.S. texts. In this case, it will be the decision in Fisher. And as you see, I highlighted here that U.S. Supreme Court majority opinions and dissents are very important. So uh, as Dean Chemerinsky mentioned, in the Fisher case, it was a seven to one decision. So we do have one dissenting opinion, that's justice. In the Fisher case, there was, uh, as Dean Chemerinsky mentioned, it was a seven to one opinion, which means the one is the minority. And if you're in the dissent, you're in the minority on the court. And that was Justice Ginsburg. And so that is included here in the standard. They'll be able to analyze majority versus a minority or dissenting opinion. Also under English language arts standards are the important speaking and listening standards. And in this one, uh, the focus is that listeners can follow a line of reasoning presented by a speaker. So if you're a speaker, you need to focus on giving something that is reasoned. And of course, is based on information that you've read. And also that as a speaker, you speak in a style that's appropriate to your audience. So if you're doing something formal as in a role play, you're playing a trustee of a public university, you're going to speak as a trustee of a public university. Then we move on to the history social studies standards, and these are the reading and history social studies standards. And this is where we focus on citing specific textual evidence, as well as determining central ideas of a text, as well as evaluating various explanations for the events that are in a text. And using a Supreme Court decision is a great way, an ideal way in some ways, to evaluate various explanations for an event, because you have majority and minority opinions. So the various explanations are given right there. These reading uh, standards also apply to all of the uh, background that they'll get for the role play as well as the writing activities. And that brings us to the writing standards. The first one you see here under text types and purposes, it has to do with the third writing activity that I outlined above, and that's so students can write arguments that are focused on discipline-specific content. And there are substandards um, under this uh, main standard that give students the guidelines and give you as a teacher the guidelines for showing them how to write an argumentative piece on discipline-specific content. And the next two writing standards under research to build and present knowledge and range of writing relate to all three of the writing activities that they would be doing with this particular lesson. It's important that they can do a range of writing activities, whether it's doing something right in class, writing a paragraph there in class, whether it's a quick write or something that's related to one of the writing activities outlined here, or something that's long term, like a research paper. That's a range of writing that's really important for a Common Core State Standards. Now with that, uh, we finished the content really of this webinar. You've gotten the background from Dean Chemerinsky. We've talked about the Common Core State Standards as they relate to using Supreme Court cases. And we've talked about the specific lesson on using the affirmative action case. We have some additional webinars that are coming up. The next one is next week. I'll be on that webinar as well. And it has to do with teaching the Federalist Papers. It's geared mostly toward middle school. 
but uh, high school teachers, I welcome you as well to register for this webinar. We've got a lot of people who've registered for this already. And as you see, there's the link on this particular slide. I'll be sending that link to you as well as a follow-up today to this webinar. So if men were angels teaching the Constitution with the Federalist Papers next week, the following week we'll have the Common Core does not have to be a great wall, fun ways to teach about China for middle school and elementary school. And finally, uh, here is civic engagement plus writing equals uncommonly good idea. And this is one that we will be presenting along with our colleagues over at the National Writing Project who included our civic action project in a book called Uncommonly Good Ideas on teaching common core state standards in civic education. And so that's one not to miss. It's on civic engagement and writing, especially collaborative writing, which is part of Common Core State Standards. Before I forget, uh, I want to just address any questions you might have about any of the material that we've covered, um, any of the material that I've covered on Common Core State Standards. You can write those questions, of course, in the chat area. Uh, one question is, how do you get students to use precedent as evidence. And we have a great response here from our colleague Laurel Singleton in Colorado. Um, I think that using school-based discipline decisions can be a good way to introduce precedents. If student A was treated in a particular way, how should student B be treated in similar but not identical circumstances? That's great. That's actually a great way because that brings it to something that's really concrete for the students. If it's something that's school-based, so it's not abstract as many Supreme Court decisions might seem because it's removed from students' direct experience, what Laurel's telling us here, and I agree, is when you can bring something to students' more direct experience and use an example from school, that actually will help students to relate to understanding precedent. Also, another question is uh, do we have any ideas on how to use Supreme Court, the Supreme Court in elementary classes? And uh, this question was asked earlier uh, when Dean Chemerinsky was uh, speaking, and he actually spoke to that quite well. Uh, there are Supreme Court cases you can talk to about, uh, uh, talk to elementary students about, especially in fifth grade, which in many states, including California, relate to United States history. Um, there are important Supreme Court decisions. Um, one that uh, I think would be really great, and you can talk to elementary students all the way up through um, seniors in high school, of course, is uh, our uh, 1954 decision on the 14th Amendment and the integration of public schools. That's something that relates specifically to public school classrooms, students who are in public school, understanding the, the important basis for integration in public schools. So Brown versus Board of Education, I think would be a great case to be able to talk to any grade level about uh, in understanding equal protection under the law and due process of law. Again, there's the legalese, but understanding it in the sense of this is a way that the courts rule that uh, public schools should not be segregated according to race is a great way of, of explaining those principles perhaps not even, without even using uh, at uh, elementary grade levels the specific legalese or legal language, but using the language of integration versus segregation uh, and that everyone is treated equally under the law. Uh, that's a good way of phrasing it. And uh, moving forward, um, I just want to say if you have any other questions related to the webinar, please feel free to email me directly. Uh, you all have my email because I've been sending out the reminders and I'm going to send you another email today. So you can write to me directly and I'd be happy to consider your questions and respond to you. This is the slide I promised would reappear in the webinar. Take our survey, which you're about to get the link to. Again, this is for K-12 through teachers who are on this webinar. And this is so that the first 10 teachers who registered and who are still on this webinar right now uh, attending it will be eligible for the $50 stipend. But all educators, all teachers who are on this uh, webinar will be entered into a drawing for one of two $500 cash prizes or one of $100 prizes. And without further ado, where is that link? Well, here we go. 
if you go to our website, crf-usa.org slash common hyphen core slash survey, you'll be taken right to that survey. It'll take you a few minutes to fill it out. Now, the survey is intended for those who have used some of our common core resources. If you haven't visited our common core resources page, there's a link on that page, the survey page for you to go to. But you can use this webinar as well as something that is a resource provided by CRF. It's professional development in linking common core state standards to teaching social studies content. So go ahead and use this webinar as your example of something that uh, helped your understanding, we hope, in, under in looking at the connections between common core and social studies. And I have a note down there. I am going to especially thank my colleague sitting right next to me, Laura Wesley, for fielding questions and doing a lot of the tech. Because without someone who's tech savvy, I'd be lost. With that, I want to thank everyone for being on this webinar, uh, in addition to Laura, and all of you who have participated, and of course, our special guest, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. We're always grateful for his participation in our programs.